All right, so Rose MacBook keeps messing up on the recording, so that's why I would like to do one whole recording, but her MacBook keeps messing up, so it, technical difficulties, like I said. All right, so we have something called the auxentic region. Whenever you hear auxentic gland area, just think the parietal. This is this is where the acid happens, right? This is where your acid secretion takes place because right there you have the body, the corpus, and the and the fundus, right? Um, pyloric gland area is 15% of your stomach mucosa. Um, right here you have the antrum and pylorus, right? And the reason why this is important is because notice how there's a zone right here where they change, where the gastric mucosa kind of changes right there and right here. And also right here too, between the pyloric region and the duodenum. The reason why this is important is because those are places where the ulcers occur at the mucosal junction. So, like he just talked about right here at these mucosal junctions is basically where ulcers tend to occur what is an, what is the difference between an erosion and an ulcer remember what I said remember what I said is um, you have MS, MS. So the mucosal layer is three things. Uh, one is the epithelium. Then you have the uh, loose connective tissue, uh, the lamina propria is what they call it. Um, then you have the muscularis mucosa. So an ulcer, the, 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 an erosion, an erosion would only go as far as the muscularis mucosa. It does not pass the muscularis mucosa. If it passes, if it were to pass the muscularis mucosa, then at that point, anything that passes, anything that passes the muscularis mucosa, we call these guys ulcers. So ulcers occur at the uh, esophageal junction at the, we call, we also have gastric ulcers and we also have duodenal ulcers. How can you get your esophageal ulcer? Remember that I told you that if you have your esophagus, it comes down like this and then you have the stomach, right? It comes down like this. Right here at the, at the gastroesophageal junction, you have your lower esophageal sphincter, which I said is tonically constricted. It's always closed unless you're eating. The reason for that is because you have this acid in your stomach and this acid in your stomach, what's keeping it from going up? Well, I mean, you could say gravity and shit, but really it's the lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter is closed for a reason. It stops this acid from coming back up and it protects us. So if there's a problem with the lower esophageal sphincter, guess what you're gonna have? You're gonna have like a whole bunch of scars, a whole bunch of bleeding, a whole bunch of ulcers at the esophageal junction. Um, Gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers, collectively, we call those peptic ulcers. I know you guys had an SGL that talked about peptic ulcers. Just to be clear, a peptic ulcer can be both, can be, when we say peptic ulcers, we're talking about either a gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer. Gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers are peptic ulcers. Why is it called peptic ulcers? You guys are probably wondering. The reason why it's called peptic ulcers is because um, a long time ago, before we made these more discoveries of GI physiology, um, people who had ulcers and stomach aches and stuff like that, scientists went into the stomach, and they would they would uh, people when they would have ulcers, they would they went to the stomach and they would they would um, take out some of that liquid. And they would see, ah, this liquid has pepsin, which, as I said earlier, is true, right? Because, you know, the chief cells secrete pepsinogen, and then it's the acid in the stomach, the acidic environment of the stomach, that activates it into pepsin. So scientists back then thought that these ulcers were because of pepsin. That's not true. The ulcers were because of the gastric acid, secondary to something else. But I'll talk more about that later. Um, so that's when Pepsi was created. Because back then in Pepsi, soda had sodium bicarbonate in it. 
So when you would have, you know, a little stomach burning, a little stomach burn, uh, you know, a, a, a little heartburn, people would be like, oh, drink a Pepsi, drink a Pepsi. Because the bicarb, the bicarb ion in Pepsi was thought to relieve the acid, the acid that scientists thought was caused by pepsin. Back then, scientists believed that pepsin was the one responsible for activating your um, parietal cells and secreting gastric acid. The only reason why they thought that is because those because when they would take the, the, the juice out of your stomach, they would find pepsin in it. Little did they know that the pepsin that the pepsin is actually be, is actually coming from pepsinogens, which is being released by chief cells. And, and this is just again what I was talking about right here. Um, like I said, the chief cells secrete pepsinogen, which is then cleaved into pepsin, and then the pepsin does the protein digestion. Um, parietal cells. I did. I said secrete two things. Two things. Don't forget them. Hydrochloric acid, that's, that's easy. Intrinsic factor. Why is this important? This is important. This is really important for B12 absorption. And I'll talk more about that later. Uh, you know, endocrine cells, um, you know, gastrin, histamine, somatostatin. Uh, so, gastric acid, the juice varies with secretory rate. Um, what, are we, what are we trying to say here is that. Um, the more you secrete um, gastric juice, the more acidic it is. As you can see, look at the secretory rate right here, that the more secretory rate, the more acidic it is. And you can also see um, that the less sodium it has. So in, in that case, we can see that the slower the secretory rate, we can say that the more sodium it has and the less hydrogen ion it has. How do these secretions happen? Well, this is just a terrible slide that he has on his presentation. I got a better one. But before I show you this one, I could just talk about it right here. Um, so basically, you have a parietal cell like this. Right? This is your parietal cell. This right here is the lumen of your stomach. Um, so th and then you have right here, you have... Um, right here, you have... Uh, arterial blood flow and then right here you have venous and then right here you have venous blood flow right because right here in between them you have the capillaries right so right here you have the capillaries capillaries are right here the fenestrations and stuff all right so co2 co2 enters the parietal cell hmm sounds a little familiar right kind of like the respiratory lecture we just got out of what happens to CO2? CO2 joins water and they become carbonic acid. Via what? Carbonic anhydrase. Very good. Carbonic anhydrase. Then carbonic anhydrase acts again on acts on carbonic acid and you get hydrogen ion and you get an ion of bicarb. Now this hydrogen ion leaves the parietal cell through a uh, antiporter as hydrogen ion leaves potassium enters for hydrogen ion to leave potassium has to has to potassium ion has to enter what happens to the bicarb the bicarb leaves through a antiporter as well when the bicarb leaves chloride ion enters so what happens to this chloride ion that's entering and what's, happen what's happening to this potassium ion that's entering? Well, they both have channels that are always open, so they both leave together. And then I said the bicarb is here. And interestingly enough, where you'll find, and what is this bicarb going to do? The bicarb is going to increase the pH, which is going to make your blood more alkaline over here so they say that we call they say that your blood has the highest pH or is the most alkaline during a meal and even after a meal when it's being digested when it's being digested because of this because you have as you have this secretion 
as you have the secretion of hydrogen ion, you're also going to have this sec secretion of bicarb into the blood. And we actually gonna we actually call this the alkaline tide. We call this the alkaline tide. So just a little a little good uh, trivia there. Where is the blood more, most alkaline at? At the blood vessels, the venous the venous blood vessels of the of the stomach. Why? Because the cells are secreting hydrogen ion and then bicarb is being pumped into the blood. And that's basically what this slide is saying, right? CO2 enters the parietal cell joins with water, becomes carbonic acid. The carbonic acid is acted on by carbonic anhydrase to become hydrogen ion and bicarb, right? Bicarb leaves the cell in exchange for chloride ion. What happens to the hydrogen ion? The hydrogen ion leaves the cell and this difference in charge has to be balanced. Who balances it? Potassium ion. Potassium ion enters the cell, right? And we're going to call this, and, and we're going to call this the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump, right? And then we have these channels that are always open for potassium and chloride to leave. And that's basically what he's saying here. Right here, we have the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. Hydrogen leaves, potassium enters. These channels are always open. Potassium is leaving, the chloride is leaving as well. Again, we can expand this and understand that the chloride is coming in as the bicarb is leaving. And then where does the bicarb come from? Bicarbonic acid, which is broken down into hydrogen ion and bicarb, and then this is coming from CO2 and water, right? So with that background, let's look at number 85. Go ahead and answer it. It says, the parietal cell secretion of, a, of an acid chloride is transported through its conductance channel by its couple to, what is this, what is this saying? This is saying that um, acid chloride, right, hydrogen chloride secretion happens in conjunction with another source. What ha happens in conjunction with a, with, a, with, with a channel, and that channel is your hydrogen potassium ATPase. Like I said, if this is the lumen, and this is the parietal cell. We have hydrogen ion leaving and potassium coming in. Um, and that's, this is just a confusing slide. I'm sure you can look back at what I said and kind of make sense of it, but not much to talk about here. Uh, so right here we have the mucosal layer as we said, I have, we have epithelial cells right here. The, the, the intracellular makeup of these epithelial cells is really high in bicarbonate. So that, mean, that means they have a really high pH because they're the ones that are secreting the bicarb. Now this, mu this, mucus, this mucus layer is a good buffer to protect you from the chloric acid in the, in the lumen and to also protect you from um, the uh, protein digestive enzymes like pepsin, right? So we want to protect ourselves from, from enzymes that are going to just destroy us and also from the acid that will destroy us. Just a good thing about mucus in general, it's made up of glycoproteins. So, you know, later on next year, you guys will learn about, um, you know, staining bacteria. Certain bacteria have certain mucus um, components to them. So you can use like mucus stains to, to stain those um, bacteria. And also cancers. There are mucus producing cancers and you can use mucus stains to stain those, bacteria, those cancers. And the, the step one question would be like, what are you staining? The answer would be glycoproteins. Uh, and this is just a, uh, a graph that just proves the difference in pH. So like I said, in the lumen you have a pH, a really low pH, one to two, that, that will burn your skin off. Then you have a, a neutral pH of seven over here at the mucosa. How is this happening? These epithelial, these mucosal cells are releasing bicarbonate along with mucus. And you can see that the pH goes from acidic at the lumen. And as it goes through the mucus, right before it hits, right before it hits the, 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 the apical, right here at the apical, at the apical membrane of the mucosal cells, by, then, by that time we have a neutral pH of about 7. 
and then inside the cell you should have a a little uh, uh, an also a neutral pH of seven. I know earlier I said that you had should have a high pH of of, of uh, higher pH, but this graph is showing that you have a neutral pH of seven. What happens if we damage this? What happens if we damage the mucus? That's protecting us. Well, if we damage the mucus that's protecting us from acid, acid's going to go in. Acid's going to activate these mast cells. What do mast cells release? Histamine. Histamine is a chemotactic factor. It's going to secrete, it's going to recruit all of these other cells like polymorphonucleic cells. This is just a fancy word for neutrophils. Neutrophils. Whenever you see PMNs, just think neutrophils, right? Furthermore, the acid is also going to chew up on your capillaries. It's going to destroy them. And you'll get all of this blood released. This protein is going to be released because, don't forget, those pepsin, pepsin enzymes can now, enter, can now enter and can now cross through the mucus. You're going to get edema because, like I said, the capillaries are damaged, so fluid's going to leak out. Um, and what, what's the cause of this? What can, what, what, can, what can cause this, this destruction of the mucus layer? This is high yield right here. You got to know this. H. pylori. Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria that is the number one leading cause of both gastric and duodenal ulcers. More so duodenal ulcers than gastric, and I'll explain why later. later. Now, as you can see right here, you have the mucus layer. And this, and this mucus layer is where the Helicobacter pylori live and where they thrive. They do not cross the epithelium. Let's just, just, let's just make a big point of that. They do not cross the epithelium. They strictly stay right there at the um, gastric, at the mucus layer. How do they work? Well, this helicobacter species, they release something called mucinase, mucinase, an enzyme that acts on mucin. So it degrades that, glyco, that mucin glycoprotein, therefore, get, therefore chewing up the mucus layer and chewing right through it and, and allowing the acid to then destroy the mucus cells in the epithelial layer. Um, these, cells also, these cells also secrete a urease. Urease turns urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. So why is this important? Well, the reason why this is important is because you can diagnose, this is, this is how you kind of diagnose a helicobacter infection. If someone, if someone comes to the clinic and they're like, hey, my stomach hurts, it feels like I have heartburn, you know, gastric burning sensation, epigastric pain, and you are suspecting helicobacter pylori infection, which you should, you can do something called a urease breath test. And in a urease breath test, you basically give the person, you tell them to consume a pill of radioactive urea. The radioactive urea is then, is then going to be acted upon by the urease of the helicobacter, and you're going to get radioactive carbon dioxide. This radioactive labeled carbon dioxide is going to diffuse into the bloodstream, ultimately is going to reach the alveoli, and you're going to breathe out this radioactive, this radio, radioactive labeled carbon dioxide. And is, if you detect a radioactive label, carbon dioxide, and a urea breath test, that means you're positive for helicobacter pylori infection. And here's just another quick diagram of how it works. Like I said, radioactive label uh, uh, urea is given to the patient. The helicobacter pylori then acts on the urea and makes carbon dioxide and ammonia. The radioactive, uh, radioactive labeled carbon dioxide goes into the blood goes to the lungs, and you breathe it out and collect it. Uh, one more thing about Helicobacter pylori is that it destroys the D cells. What do the D cells do, D cells do again? D cells secrete somatostatin. Statin meaning it turns everything off. So somatostatins, since they turn everything off, they actually inhibit G cells, right? They inhibit G cells from secreting gastrin. Because don't forget, somatostatin turns everything off. So if you get rid of the people that turn things off, that means that everything is that means that everything is going to be turned on. So 
if Helicobacter pylori infection is destroying the number of D cells, so it's going to decrease them. If you decrease the number of D cells, then that means you're going to decrease the amount of somatostatin that's excreted by the D cells. That means that G cells are no longer going to be inhibited, meaning they're free to make a whole bunch of gastrin. What is gastrin going to do? Gastrin is going to tell those parietal cells to secrete chloric acid. As you, se as you secrete all of these tons of gastrin, parietal cells are going to hi hi hyperplasia, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, and you'll have more parietal cells and even more gastric acid secretion. All of this because the Helicobacter pylori decided to fuck up some D cells. So how does how does um, here's just a, here's just a quick touch up on somatostatin. Just what first aid has to say. Somatostatin, as I've said before, it's secreted by D cells. What does it do? Turns off everything. As you can see, everything is being lowered. Um, and here's just a slide of where he talks about Dr. Littleton talks about somatostatin. Uh, where is it over here? As I said, uh, somatostatin is a stimulus for secretion, is acid environment, um, and it's everywhere in the, in the GI, and it's going, to inhibit the, it's going to inhibit gastric acid secretion, right? So that means that if you destroy the somatostatin, the D cells that, that make the somatostatin, that means that this gastric acid secretion is no longer there, which means that this, this inhibition of gastric, gastric, that gastric acid secretion is no longer there, then you'll have more gastric acid secretion, which will exacerbate the, the um, acid symptoms, and you'll have uh, ulcers. So with that background, let's look at this question. It says, H. pylori increases gastric acid secretion in the stomach by which of the following? A, decreases the myostatin in D cells. Well, we just talked about that, right? That's kind of true. Let's just see what else happens. I mean, it is true. Let's just see if they have some stronger answer choices. B, increasing acetylcholine secretion. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. Increasing acetylcholine secretion, that's 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 gonna be due to that's going to be due to distension of the stomach. When the stomach distends because of stomach content in there. Increasing parietal cell secretion. Um, H. pylori doesn't really directly secrete anything that increases parietal cell secretion directly. H. pylori this is going to secrete urease, this is going to secrete mucinase, and a whole bunch of other things. But all of these things aren't going to directly um, increase parietal cell secretion, so that's not true. What increases parietal cell secretion is HAG, right? Histamine, acetylcholine, and gastrin. Stimulating ECL secretion. Okay, um, H. pylori doesn't secrete histamine. So that's not true. Remember, what ECL secrete ECL secretion is stimulated by uh, gastrin, right? Gastrin, and then the ECL cells secrete histamine, which is part of the HAG mnemonic. The best answer here is going to be a so decrease the somatostatin D cells. When you secrete, when you decrease the somatostatin D cells, that's when you that is when you get increased gastric acid secretion. Here's just an example of my HAG mnemonic that I talked about. Um, and like I said, H, A, G, all act in the parietal cell to ultimately secrete chloric acid. What this slide is showing you is that they actually work together, not independently per se. When they work together, they get more, even more abundance of chloric acid secretion if they were to work by themselves compared to if they work by themselves. And again, gastrin, gastrin molecules using the TCK uh, receptor. Um, here's just a parietal cell. Again, HAG causes stimulation. There's a whole bunch of ways you can treat gastric ulcers. It's by block. You can block these guys from doing it. Uh, also, naturally, our body naturally makes prostaglandin. To be, to be specific, prostaglandin I2. Prostaglandins, they are the ones who are going to act on the on their recept on prostaglandin receptors, and they're going to uh, intracellularly, they're going to inhibit uh, the CAMP buildup, and by doing so, they 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 are going to basically um, inhibit this so this hydrogen potassium ATPase pump from working. So, 
Can you guys think of anything that can decrease prostaglandins from your body? That's right. Insects. Insects. Insects inhibit something called the COX pathway, right? Cyclooxygenase pathway. The cyclooxygenase pathway is responsible for making your prostaglandins. Your prostaglandins. So if insects inhibit the COX pathway, then that means you can't make prostaglandins. If you can't make prostaglandins, you can't inhibit histamine. If you can't inhibit histamine, then you get a lot of hydrogen ion secretion. This is a good concept where we could, we could kind of segue into first aid, but first aid has all of these here. Um, as I said, HAG, H-A-G is right there. Somatostan, as I said, turns everything off. As you can see, somatostan acts on a G-coupled receptor to inhibit CAMP because CA, the, it's the CAMP buildup that acts on the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. Right here we have the prostaglandins that like I just talked about. They also work the same way somatostatin does by inhibiting CAMP buildup. And by doing so, they would, they would ultimately inhibit the CAMP action on the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump. What are some of the pharmacology we can use to directly inhibit uh, histamine? We can use histamine blockers. Uh, we can use histamine blockers. And those histamine blockers we can use, they all end in dying. They all end in dying. So a good mnemonic here is you, uh, a good mnemonic for the receptor itself is table for two, as in H2. And then a good mnemonic for the pharmacology, you say you take H2 blockers before you dine, right? And that kind of segues into this slide where he talks about all of the H2 receptor antagonists, which all end in dying. Particularly the one that you should know is cimetidine, cimetidine, because that one has a whole bunch of side effects. What's the best way to, to, to treat gastric acid uh, secretions, um, to prevent gastric acid secretions? You give them something called omeprazole. And just continuing over here, omeprazole is a proton pump inhibitor. So when I say proton pump, I'm talking about the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump, right? Because hydrogen is a proton. It's pumping out hydrogen ion. In return, potassium ions going into the cell. So omeprazole, what that does is act directly on this hydrogen, hydrogen potassium ATPase pump, also known as a proton pump inhibitor. And right here, you have your proton pump inhibitors, which all end in azole. Azole, 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 azole. So we're talking about omeprazole, which acts directly. Omeprazole acts directly on the pro on the proton pump. So it stops hydrogen ion from being secreted and potassium from going into the cell. This is one of the best pharmacology to use for ulcers, mind you. The first line therapy for ulcers infected with Helicobacter with Helicobacter, H. pylori, is always going to be the treatment of H. pylori itself, which is antimicrobial. So you always give the antimicrobial triple therapy first. You'll learn more about that second year. But if this comes up on your exam, since H. pylori is on these slides, it's fair game. The way you treat H. pylori infected, infected infection uh, ulcers is you treat the H. pylori first because H. pylori is the underlying condition that is causing the ulcers. If you knock out the H. pylori, you will see improvement in the ulcers. Now, at the same time, you want to give them the proton pump inhibitors. Absolutely. But more empirically is you want to treat the H. pylori with antibiotics. This just talks about the, um, the different phases of secretion in, this, in, in your GI. You have something called the interdigestive phase, which is when you're not eating. That's when your MMC complex is working to you know, clean out your, your gut, your GI, cleaning out the dead bacteria and things that were left over. Cephalic phase is when you're chewing, when you smell food, you taste food. Um, like I said, chewing, it's in your mouth. Uh, you can see that gastric acid secretion is 30%. The gastric phase itself was when, is when the food is in the stomach. It's 50%. That makes sense. And then you have the intestinal phase, which is the lowest gastric acid secretion, which 
you may think the interdigestive phase when you're not eating is when you have the lowest acid secretion. Uh-uh. It's right after you eat. Right after you eat is when you have the lowest amount of gastric acid secretion. And that's what he talks about here. Um, right here, he talks about um, how, okay, in the cephalic phase, right? You know, you, all of that, you know, uh, limbic system. You smell the food. Oh, I see, you know, that they have wing, wing, today's wing, wing, they have wings in the cafeteria. Your vagus nerve goes crazy. Your vagus nerve ultimately secretes bombesin. Okay, bombesin is the same thing as GRP. It's just the old ass way of, that's the name. Before they called it GRP, they used to call it bombesin. GRP stands for, remember, gastrin releasing peptide. Gastrin releasing peptide is going to act on the G cell to secrete gastrin, and then the gastrin is going to act on the auxintic cell. That's another way of saying prilosol, right? We know that. Um, and also it's going to secrete acetylcholine, and we know acetylcholine is also going to act on the parietal cell. Um, here's just how I talked about it, right? Vagus nerve, you eat food, it comes in. As you're chewing it in your mouth, your vagus nerve starts to send signals to your stomach. What are these signals? GRP and acetylcholine. When it's in the mouth, when you're chewing, when you smell food, when you see it. Then you have the gastric phase. In the gastric phase, then the food contacts are in your stomach. It distends the stomach, and you have an even, even stronger, uh, you have local reflexes that secrete even more acetylcholine and even more GRP. So with that, um, so if you want to, so in, and ultimately, in the gastric phase is where you have 50% gastric acid secretion. And most of it, almost all of it, is being stimulated by these, by these nerves, by these nerves, right, that are secreting acetylcholine and secreting GRP. You have 50% gastric acid secretion. So with that background, let's go ahead and look at this question. All right, the question says, why would a surgeon elect to cut the branches of the nerve indicated by the dashed line in the figure to the right? Well, remember, what is being, what are these nerves releasing that's causing, that would, that would, that would uh, want a surgeon to, to, to cut these nerves off? These nerves are secreting, are releasing acetylcholine, and they're also releasing uh, GRP. And all of these guys, GRP is going to act on the G cells to secrete gastric. And both acetylcholine and the gastrin are going to act on the parietal cell to secrete hydrogen ion. So someone who's suffering from ulcers and, 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 and pharmacology just isn't working for them, a surgeon would choose to go in there and cut the nerves off. And that would be... Again, the intestinal phase is when the food is in the is in the is in the um, the small intestines and the colon, and then in and then in the intestines like not in the stomach, right? Um, and then right here, you have very very little gastric acid secretion. Uh, I think he, in, the, in the slide earlier it said five percent. So um, here's just a really clutch really clutch graph. As you can see. Right here, this, da this, this dashed line represents hydrogen ion secretion. Hydrogen, so when you, when you eat a meal, you have the cephalic phase and stuff like that. Uh, the rate of secretion starts to go up. The rate of secretion starts to go up. Um, but, the, but the actual concentration of hydrogen ion is pretty low one to two hours after you eat a meal. So this is doing your intestinal this is this this is this is doing your intestinal phase is when this is happening. Then eventually the hydrogen ion starts to go up, really really high, and um, you have uh, actually you know you have a, a low, really low pH in your stomach. So with that, keep that in mind. Hmm. When you eat food, after you eat food, that one to two hour span is when you have the lowest gas, when you have the lowest hydrogen ion concentration in your stomach. So, someone who's suffering from, from ulcers, peptic ulcers, people who suffer from duodenal ulcers tend to eat meals all the time. 
because these people get relief. These people get relief from eating. Why? Because when they eat, when you eat food, one to two hours after you eat food, you have the lowest amount of hydrogen ion, of, of acid. So people with duodenal ulcers get pain relief from eating. People with gastric ulcers actually get more pain from eating. They get more pain from eating. And that's a big difference between, between a gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer, is the fact that the duodenal ulcer decreases with meal. So these people tend to gain weight because you're eating all the time because the eating causes relief. And then the gastric ulcer, the pain is greater with meals. And remember what I said earlier is that gastric ulcers are and duodenal ulcers are both peptic ulcers. Um, and check this out. I said helical bacteria pylori infection is responsible for 90% of duodenal ulcers and 70% for gastric ulcers. You For gastric ulcers, you can have other causes include um, insects. Remember what insects do? Insects uh, block, uh, insects, um, block in, um, synthesis of prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are protective of the, the mucosa. Um, and then right here, for duodenal ulcers, other causes include uh, cancer, zollinger ellison syndrome, which is very, very rare, very, very rare, is a pancreatic cancer. Um, so with that, let's look at these questions right here. Go ahead and answer 86. All right, 86 says, a 40-year-old man comes to his physician's office complaining of epigastric pain, an upper endoscopy revealed duodenal erosions, and a test for gastric Secretory function reveals markedly elevated levels of basal acid secretion. In crafting a treatment, in which of the time frame hours after a meal do you expect the stomach acid to be at its lowest concentration? Slam dunk, right? The answer here is B. The question is saying, when is the stomach acid the lowest concentration? We're not talking about secretory rate. That's not what the question is asking. The question is asking about concentration. Concentration. It's not asking about secretory rate. We look at the concentration of, of acid in the in the in the stomach. We can see that hydrogen acid is lowest from one to two hours, and that the rate is highest at about three hours. So if this was asking you about the rate, then the answer would be D. But since we're asking about concentration, the answer is B. If we look at eighty nine. 89 says a 46-year-old man makes an appointment with his physician with a complaint of dyspepsia. The patient tells his doctor that he has little or no discomfort while eating, but two or three hours after the meal, he feels a burning pain in the epigastrium. If the patient has an ulcer, which of the following is the most likely site of the lesion? So, this guy says that he has little to no pain when he eats, but two or three hours after he eats, then he gets a bunch of pain. Where is the ulcer? Well, what ulcer did we say is relieved by eating? We said that duodenal ulcers are relieved by eating meals, which is why people who have duodenal ulcers eat all the time because, because after you eat, one to two hours after that, you have the lowest acid concentration in your GI. After the one to two hours is up, then from three hours up, from three hours on, then your then your acid secretion, your acid concentration starts to go up really high. So, what's following that time frame? Is this this scenario right here, right? So that means he must have a duodenal ulcer, and duodenal ulcers tend to be in the first part of the duodenum, which can also be called the superior duodenum. To use the answer. And just to make sure you can you tie this all in, let's look at number 90. It says, following the perforation of a peptic ulcer, a 53-year-old man feels an aching pain in his left shoulder. These symptoms suggest that the gastric contents are irritating the... So this is just a kind of throwback to like SF1, SF2. Um, perforation means opening, right? So the peptic ulcer, peptic ulcer can be either gastric or duodenal, right? Um, point is it open. And when it opens, um, you have all of that 
gastric uh, content spill out into the peritoneum and it's going to irritate local structures, right? One of those structures is the diaphragm, right? If your stomach, your esophagus comes down here and then it goes in and then you have your stomach like this and then you have your small intestine. If there's a hole, like either from a, you know, gastric ulcer or a duodenal ulcer, all of this junk is going to seep out into your peritoneum and it's going to irritate the diaphragm. What innervates the diaphragm? What innervates the diaphragm? Good. The phrenic nerve. What is the phrenic nerve made of? C3, C4, and C5, right? 3, 4, 5 keeps you alive. Um, and what does 3, 4, 5 also innervate? It also innervates your shoulder and also your arm too, right? So pain pain being uh, projected from the afferents and the phrenic nerve, as they go into your dorsal horns, they can also stimulate, they can also stimulate, they can also stimulate these nerves that innervate your shoulder and make it seem as though you also have pain in your, your shoulder. So the answer here is B, underside of the diaphragm. Actually, I had this exact same question in one of my classes for physical diagnosis second year. So it's a it's something you should be very familiar with. Step one likes to test it too. Easy points, easy, easy points, right? How can gastric acid stuff mess with your shoulder? Boom, diaphragm, that's, that's the connection right there. All right, I've been talking too much, so go ahead and take a break. Let everything, you know, go in. Again, if you feel as though you know this lecture, you're really confident with it, then just, just you don't have to watch this, these videos. Um, or if you feel as though there was an area in this lecture where you didn't understand what Dr. Littleton was saying, just fast forward to that part. Again, I'm going through the whole lecture. What I, my point is this, is that if you can master this lecture, then you can do, you shouldn't be able to get any GI physiology questions wrong this year and next year.